is good. That was excellent. That was excellent. We haven't seen John in a while, so let's just welcome John again. Yes. Alrighty. And we thank God for all of the victories that surround the opposition experiences. We have testimonies. You have testimonies. I look forward to you know, having you up here one of these days just to share a little bit. I know on the men's call and in the men's meetings, we've been hearing some of it. But we're so thankful to God to have you here. Once again, let's celebrate all the mothers in the house. Mother's Day was phenomenal. Completely off the chain. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The joy. Come on now. Praise the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I mean, the worship on Saturday was so amazing. There's no way you would know that some of these guys literally blew in from out of town to be here on stage. And you couldn't tell. I mean, when I saw Bennett outside, he looked exhausted. But once he came in here, he became a new person. And I just know that it is the joy of knowing the significance of what we do in his name. You see, when we have joy in serving in his name, it gives us strength. And I know some of the women also were a little exhausted from the setup, the food and all of that. But you couldn't tell. You know, the worship was great. The fellowship was awesome. And the word was off the chain. Come on now. Praise the Lord. God is good. I am still so excited about it. Let's celebrate these guys. God bless you. You may be seated. God is good. Alrighty, God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. God is good. Now we're going to go to Luke chapter 16 very quickly. Luke, we're taking a look at Luke chapter 16. And we're going to read a verse of scripture from verse 8. One of the things that the Lord's been schooling me on lately is, um, I, I mean, I, I, I've thought about some fancy name for it. Um, I've thought about maybe having a segment, I don't know where yet, maybe online, maybe in person, or maybe on the men's call, and just call it uh, two by three. You see what I mean? And um, when I explain it, maybe you would even come up with a better name than me, because you know, it's not one of my strongest points to give names that people like to things, except for children. You know, but when it comes to naming enterprises and products, yeah, let somebody else do that. But this is what the Lord's been leading me in. You know, the Bible says that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be established. And it started to occur to me in greater detail that the reason why sometimes our hearts struggle to hold on to the promises of God is because we do not have two or three witnesses. We have maybe half a scripture that we heard from a podcast. You know, some of us, we're working with just one verse of scripture that we remember from Bible study when we were 12 years old. But the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. I know there are several applications of that particular scripture, but I'm only telling you about one of the ways by which the Holy Spirit is letting that scripture make fresh sense to me. And I sat there under his tutelage and we were going through a couple of scriptures and those scriptures started to have more meaning. And I started to feel more of the power of those scriptures the moment I would combine two or three scriptures together. You understand what I mean? Combining two or three scriptures together and a lot started to make sense. And I thought to myself, wow, we've known this thing forever. That it is not enough to just stand on one leg. That is better to stand on two. You understand what I mean? And if you have wings to go with it, even better. And so, I want to encourage you. If there are promises in the word of God that seem to have not taken root in your heart, begin to engage yourself in the two or three witnesses approach. Find yourself two or three scriptures that go together around the same subject and suddenly you see a different dimension of confidence, a different level of conviction. You start getting even more convinced that what you're reading are words that came from your heavenly father inspired by the Holy Ghost. 
So Hebrews, <laughs> Luke chapter 16. My brother, my brother and I, we took a break from a business call earlier today. You know, because there were just things that um, sometimes when they hit you, you know you have to phone home. So we're like, you know, we're just going to take a break from all this talk and go do some Bible study. And so we're studying the blood of Jesus. And one of the things we talked about was Hebrews chapter 12. You know, talking about the fact that we have come to the blood of sprinkling, a blood that speaks. You know, some people will say, oh, the blood of Jesus did a one-time job because on the cross, Jesus said it is finished. Yes, it is finished, but it is not ended. You see, that blood is still speaking. You know, the Bible did not say the blood that spoke. The Bible says the blood that speaks better things. And it is called sprinkling, not sprinkled. And so if anyone's talked to you out of evoking the blood of Jesus, even Jesus himself said, as often as you have, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. And what was he talking about? The ministry of his flesh and of the blood. You see, so maybe that's why Hebrews is coming out of me. But look, chapter 16, verse 8, look at, look at what it says. It says, so the master commanded the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. He commended, the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generations or in their generation than the sons of light. I know that if this was not written in red in my Bible, I may have had questions. Because it's like, wait a minute, Jesus was saying that the master commanded the unjust steward. This steward was clearly unjust, but he received a commendation from his master. But I realized that rather than have questions, I should have joy. Because if Jesus is showing us that there was an unjust steward that God commended by the master, then there is hope for every single one of us because the Bible says, whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The man of God, John, said, if we say that we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. And so if we, by our works, by some of our thoughts, by some of our in, in, inconsistencies, continue to maintain that profile of the unjust in our human form, the Bible lets us know that it is still possible for us to receive a commendation from the holy God, from the one who is called the most holy, because he is our master. And so we're going to look into some of those things today that help to remind us of the truth about our righteousness. We need to remind ourselves because righteousness is, is actually the prerequisite material or is one of the major or fundamental conditions that has to be satisfied, that has to be understood before we can enjoy the rest of our salvation package. Now let's go to verse 12 of the same Luke chapter 16. And it says, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you your own? If you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you your own? Hmm. Let's go back to verse 8. Okay, for the benefit of those people, who got born again over the weekend, who may not have read the Bible ever before. I'm going to tell you this story, just kind of like breeze through it. Actually, since the sun is not setting until about 8.37, we can read all of these verses. So why don't we just make an attempt here to read very quickly. In my Bible, it's titled, The Parable of the Unjust Steward. He, I'm reading from verse 1, he also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and he said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship. For you can no longer be steward. 
We're going to stop there and we're going to quickly go to Genesis chapter 1 verse 4 because the Lord said to me that there are four sets of people in here today. And I would like to call you out, not to come out on stage, but I want to tell you four categories of people that are here today so that when we go further into this parable of the steward, you will more easily recognize how you fulfill some of the conditions of the unjust steward in order to allow you to embrace the commendation of the same. Because sometimes the reason why we cannot embrace promises that have been demonstrated in the word of God is because we fail to see ourselves in the capacities of the people that engaged the Lord and were transformed. You know, because when you read things in scripture and you can't relate with the people you're reading about, you tend to take their story as a fairy tale, a myth, or a legend. Like, yeah, that's, yeah, things like that used to happen. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The key to unlocking the experiences of the men of old lies in being able to identify with the same. We need to be able to identify with those men as men of like passions. We need to believe when the word of God says that there is no, com there, there is no temptation that is not common to all. We need to recognize that these men had only one heart, just like you do. These men had only two eyes that were recommended to function as one just as it applies to you because if we don't think about them as men with similar frailties as ours sometimes we tend to push their accomplishments out somewhere there as things that are only obtainable by some but not by all so in order for us to see the demonstration of the strength of God in their lives we need to be able to see ourselves in their weaknesses does that make sense? Because Paul had to tell some of the people that he was ministering to, he said to them, follow me as I follow Christ. Because he was trying to help them out. Like maybe some of you can't see Christ. You can't relate with him. But I am here. I am demonstrating to you the examples. I, I identify with you. He came to some people who were struggling with their salvation, who were struggling with the understanding of righteousness. He said to them, he says, I am that is amongst you who speak in tongues more than you all. I'm in fact the chief of sinners. And that was because he wanted them to recognize that he was a man just like them. You understand what I mean? Because sometimes we tend to put certain people on a pedestal. And because we put them on this pedestal, we think that the way they obeyed God can only happen if you are one of those people. If you uh, can fast like they fasted. If you have been called like God called them. You know, some people believe that they cannot you know, do the things that Moses did because they haven't seen, seen the burning bush. You understand what I mean? And it's like, the moment you see the burning bush, you're a totally different person. You know, but you realize that after the man saw the burning bush, God wanted to kill him. You understand what I mean? After, this, after he saw, saw the burning bush, people still gossiped about him. People still, you know, spoke evil against him. He still got into trouble. He still, you know, had outbursts of anger. He was still in some ways as annoying as you are when you've not had coffee. And, and all of that is the, re the reality of Moses' experience even after he has seen the burning bush. And so if the burning bush did not help him to overcome being human, so why am I so fixated on seeing the burning bush? What did the burning bush do for the man? He was still a man. He was still afraid on some days. You know, when people wanted to stone him, he, he took cover. He didn't just stand there and say, the stones will fall because I am Neo. No, he took cover. Yeah, because yeah, I said Neo. Yeah, because, you know, Neo is the one that bullets will come in. And, you know, even bullets respect the man. I said, we can't, you know, we can't come, to, come close to you, Mr. Neo. We're just going to drop dead here and, uh, and stay dead until the enemy comes and then we get up again. You know, all of those things, <laughs> praise the Lord. God is good. Maybe because we started with the parable, like God so cinematic. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. And let's see if we can identify a couple of us, or maybe if each of us can identify ourselves here. Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. Hallelujah. Have I told you all how God blessed me with Genesis? I mean, I've, I've, said, I've said something about that here in the past. How there was once I had a, a spiritual attack that seemed like it was in the flesh. A man came into the living room of our house back then and, and challenged my faith with a series of questions. 
He didn't come in through the door. He just appeared. And um, he, he, ha he had this, he had a Mediterranean look and he was wearing a garment like a monk who had graduated awaiting to be inducted into the Sanhedrin. He looked like one of those people kind of like in between. And he came and he started to ask me questions about my faith. And I thought I did pretty well the answers that I gave. But as soon as he walked out back into the same thin air, the way he came, I found that I could no longer say that I believe. And I thought, okay, I'm going to sleep and wake up and I'll find my faith again and my joy, the joy of salvation. I woke up and I was still feeling absolutely nothing. It was almost as if he came in and he took something from me. The emptiness continued from, for weeks. I remember that, that evening I had to, I was invited to speak at a, at a small group. I went in there and in fact, they wouldn't even let me struggle too much because they remembered some of the things I said previously. I wanted to ask questions about it. So I got away with that. A bullet was dodged. But in my heart, I knew that I no longer believed at all whatever it was we were saying at that Bible study, at that small group. And then, um, anybody remembers this story apart from Rosemary? Charles remembers? Praise the Lord. Alan, Manuelita, can we give them candy after service for remembering? Praise the Lord. And if there's no candy, give them a sticker. Give them a sticker. Give them a star. Praise the Lord. But I went back to school. This was probably 1999 or no, actually it was, I think, mid 2000s, mid 2000, thereabout. Doesn't matter. I went back to school and I started to recognize that a lot of the relationships that I had in school were relationships that were based on convictions I had in the Holy Spirit. The people that were my friends were people that I believed the Lord had spoken to me concerning. Even where I was living, the faith by which I was able to acquire that place, I never paid a dime to live in that place for about five years. I moved from one apart, one unit to another unit and it was still free, but in the same subdivision. And all of those things were there. And I'm like, none of these things would have been possible without the voice that I heard, but I couldn't hear the voice anymore. And I didn't even feel like I had a connection within me to the voice. Because quite often we forget that in order for us to believe in God, we have to have had the substance with which to interact with the unseen. And that is the reason why the Bible says that God has given to each and every one of us a measure of faith. Up until that encounter, I thought that my, comf my knowledge of the things of God and my ability to believe in him was a function of how, er how young I was when I was exposed to scripture. I thought it was because of the fact that people told me about God. That's why I believe that I believed. I thought it was because I went to several children's Bibles Bible clubs, that I read the Bible on my own since I was eight. I thought those were the things that formed my faith. But when the questions came and more questions followed, I realized that it wasn't any one of those things because every one of those things, as soon as I felt the doubt take over me, I was summoned one of those experiences and it never restored my confidence in God. So I came to the conclusion that there must not be a God, that the Bible must be some, you know, made up book and all of these people that I'm friends with and, and all of the way they look at me and the way they want to interact with me must be figments of my own imagination. I came to that conclusion. But then I realized that even that conclusion was not a pleasant one because it hasn't helped me at all. It has only gotten me, it only got me to admit to myself for a moment that I would stop trying to believe. And so one of those occasions I sat and then I just remembered Genesis chapter one, where the Bible says, God said, let there be light. Let there be light. And there was light. And they occurred to me that, wait a minute, if this is darkness where I'm at, then that means I need light. I'm going to give this thing a go. Unbeknownst to me, that was the Holy Spirit leading me back to the way. So I picked up the book of Genesis and I started reading it and it looked totally like gibberish to me. So I would read Genesis chapter 1 and by the time I get to chapter 2, chapter 3, I will no longer be able to stomach whatever it was that I was reading. Everything became puzzled and hazy and I will close it back. But then the next day I'll pick it up again. Sometimes multiple times a day. I would not get past it. But 
the long and short of the story was through that traumatic experience that left me somewhat faithless for weeks, I encountered the power of creation in a way that I don't think I would have otherwise. Because not being able to read the rest of the Bible for weeks and for a while just got me reading Genesis again and again and again and again. And that chapter one of Genesis has been so you know, instrumental in making me into the person that I am today. It gives me a lot of confidence. I have a lot of confidence in the ability of the word of God to create things out of nothing. And that's because every time I read it, I went back reading it. I read it with some sort of desperation and hunger because at that particular point in time, I felt like I was in a bottomless pit, like I was falling constantly. So I want to encourage you that God is still in the business of bringing out the best of what he has in us when he has us in situations that we have concluded are the very worst of situations. You know, sometimes we'll go through difficulty, difficult situations and come to the conclusion that it has to be because of our own errors that those difficult situations has to be because of our own carelessness. That the difficult situations have to be because of other people. We can't just imagine that God that is so good would allow for me to be so tested. You understand what I mean? But the reality of it is that all of those things happen by his divine orchestration. Because if he does not break you, he cannot make you into that vessel that he sees in his mind. Because we, we often forget that we were not originally formed in the house of God. He came out to the world and he purchased us with a price. So God needed a teacup but the market had only saucers. And it's like, it's okay. As long as there is something to work with, I will break it and I will make it again. And so it doesn't matter what state we were in, he will make us into the form that he wants us to be. That's the good news. But the not too pleasant news is that that process typically requires us getting deformed. It typically requires us getting broken into pieces and sometimes left on the table and sometimes left and then you're, you're there completely broken and you see God working on other people and you're like, hey God, don't forget me. I'm here. Hey, hello God. And then you see him walk out of the room. He turns the light off and then you're in darkness, confused, alone, feeling dejected, and it comes back and it works on somebody else. And now by this time you have concluded that definitely he's forgotten you. But I tell you, God does not forget any single one of us. Jesus says, shall a woman forget her suckling child? Though they may, yet I will not. God never forgets. If you see him working on other things and making other things, he is doing so because he wants you to be made to immediately begin having experiences of glory and of life. So tell yourself, I'll be patient with the Lord. I will be patient with the Lord. You see, the Bible says that it is God that is at work in me, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So when patience is required, I still need him to give me that patience. Remember one of those famous prayers of the 80s was a man who said, Lord, I need patience and I need it now. Oh yeah, that's how to ask for patience because if you need patience, then you need it now. Because how would you even wait for that answer to the prayer, you need patience immediately. And so just that is kind of like, by the way, but I know that it's going to help somebody to actually be on their way because God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Yours might not be Genesis, yours might be Revelation, yours might be David, yours might be some other character in scripture. But when God gets you hung up on someone or something in scripture, do not be in a hurry to graduate from that class because he knows exactly how much of that you need. And that is the reason why he continues to ingest that into you or inject rather that in 
to you. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 4, without um, any more rigmarole, the Bible says, and God saw the light, that it was good. The Holy Spirit brought this to my heart in the early hours of this morning before I tell you the four categories of people from Genesis 1-4 because I know that it's a word for now. So I'm going to just quickly chip that in also. You know, God saw the light. How was God able to see the light? Not because he has eyes, because we have eyes and sometimes we haven't seen certain things that have been promised. You understand what I mean? You know, the house that God has promised you, if that house arrives today, you have legs to walk into it. You have eyes to see it. So why are you not seeing it? So the reason why God saw light was not because he has eyes to see. He saw light for one reason and one primary reason only. And you know what that reason is? Because he said, let there be light. We see the things that we say. I was speaking to my brother Greg earlier on. I said about 4 a.m. I was in inter I was I was in meditation and in glorious celebration before the Lord because you know sometimes um, when you don't know what to do about certain things, you just go to praise. You see what I mean? Because praise evokes the presence of God and he doesn't travel alone. You know, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So if you can create an ambience of praise, you will induce a particular dimension of the presence of God and that presence of God that is the praise receiving presence of God is usually filled with innumerable angels because the one you're praising is called the God of the army of angels. And so it's very impossible or it's usually impossible for there to be an innumerable company of angels without at least a couple of them knowing how to do what you don't know how to do. Does it make sense? Remember that the angels, they are in heaven, but they also know that there is an ordinance upon the earth for the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when Paul and Silas were in prison and they were singing praises to God and that evoked the presence of God that brought into the mix different orders of angels, one of them realized that, wait a minute, these people are in chains here, but in heaven, they are already free. We need to do the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. He broke them out of those chains. You see, the, the ministry of angels is such that their assignment is to do the will of the Father. That's why they're called angels. Angels are messengers. They don't have any agendas of their own. You understand what I mean? We attain... Um, Angel status or status once we have learned how to not run with our own agenda. How not to speak our own mind by expressing emotions just. But if we would speak the mind of God, the Bible says, let everyone who speak, speak as an oracle of God. So it's possible for men to become angels. And you know that I've taught around the subject when I told us about the angel of the Lord that was taking John through the many revelations. And John, you know, the Bible says an angel of the Lord came with the revelation of Jesus Christ that the heavenly father has given to him to give to his beloved John. And so John received an angel and the angel came with a scroll with the authority of heaven in the capacity of an angel. And he looked like an angel because there was no reason why John would suspect that he wasn't an angel. He was introduced as an angel. He did the things of angels. He took him to places he made him disappear, appear. He took him to several places. And after a while, John was just so blown away that he was like, man, I need, to, I need to worship this dude. This guy is on a whole new level. And as soon as he attempted to worship the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord says, no, do not worship me because I am a man just like you. You understand what I mean? The angel of the Lord says, I'm a man just like you. And he didn't stop there. He started to give us clues that... Someone like me, I'm convinced that was Daniel. You know, but that is story for another day. But, okay, somebody wants to know why I think it was Daniel. He said, I'm a man just like you. And I am of your brethren, the prophets. He says, I'm of your brethren. I am not from another settlement. I didn't come from Arabia. I am one of your brethren. I am one of your brethren, the prophet. 
And when you look at it, Daniel received the visions that were being shown to John from the hand of Gabriel. And Gabriel is an archangel. You see, even though his name means a man of God, which is interesting. It gets even deeper, doesn't it? Come to think about it. Gabriel means man of God. So in heaven, they call Gabriel a man. A man of God. But he's an archangel. So he received that from, from the end of Gabriel. And Gabriel, at no point in time, was said to be one of the descendants of Abraham. So it couldn't have been Gabriel because Gabriel was not one of his brethren. Gabriel operates at the same level as Michael, who is said to be the prince of the people of the children of, I mean, the prince of the descendants of Abraham. Michael is their prince. Michael represents their interest in heaven, according to Daniel chapter 12. But when Daniel received the revelation by God through the hand of Gabriel, do you know that Gabriel did not take the revelation back to heaven with him? He left it with Daniel because he gave it to Daniel and he said to Daniel, seal the book. Cover it up. So the last custodian that we had on record of those revelations of the things of the end times was Daniel. And when Daniel came to John, he says, I am of your brethren. I am a descendant of Abraham, just like you. I am a man. And when he gave it to John, he said to John, you do not seal the book. And what does that mean? When it, was, when it was given to Daniel, Daniel was told to seal the book. And Daniel was like, why do I need to seal the book? They said, because it's not about to happen. These things are still afar off. And when he gave it about 500 years later to John, he was like, this time around, you don't seal the book because it's about to happen. In athletics, we call that an exchange of a baton. You understand what I mean? When you receive, when you pass on an instruction that is a next step or a continuation of the instruction that you have received, that is an exchange of the baton. When I hand the baton to the last leg in the race, which is Chris, Chris is told not to give it to another man, but to only give it in exchange for the trophy. I was told to give it to another man because another man gave it to me. But when I gave it to him because he's the last man, we say to him, don't give it to anybody else. Otherwise, we'll lose the prize. Only give that baton when you're about to lift the trophy. And that was what happened. Daniel received it. He sealed it. And when it was being given to John, there was another instruction saying, you're the last man. You don't seal it. Because John did not give it to anybody else, but it was made available to the generality of us that we may know. We have it as a testimony of what has been and of things to come. And so it is very possible for you as a man to attain an angel status if you would deny yourself to qualify as a messenger of God. A messenger of God is one who would deliver the mind of God without their own sentiments, without their own grievances, and without colorizing it with their tradition or with their own limitations or premonitions. You deliver it just because that is how God said it. There are people God's told you to say to that I love you, but then you're like, I like you because you don't believe they deserve the love. Now you can do that a couple of times and God is like, well, you have not been faithful in literal, so maybe for now you don't get any more. You want to speak the mind of God? Speak it without any fear of man. Speak it as God said it to you. And so we see the things that we say. Alrighty, so what I was saying with Brother Greg, in case you were following, because I know that I've detoured here and there, but I know some of you all have become accustomed to being able to connect back uh, to the main vein. And I was talking about, I told Brother Greg, I said, in the early hours of the morning, as I was in praise and in meditation before the Lord, um, one of the things that occurred to me, not occurred to me, the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to go to Enoch. And I went to the book of Enoch and it led me exactly to where to read. I believe it's chapter 10. And it was where um, the angel of the Lord, whose name I can't pronounce because it's so long, is Arya Yalol, something like that. I don't want to butcher the name. Uh, he was the one that was sent to go to the son of Lamech, which is Noah. And, the Lord, and that was the same angel that the Lord saw how eager he was to quickly go to Noah. And God was like, hey, slow down. Don't go like this. God said to him, conceal yourself. 
He was probably one of those angels with four heads. And he was just about to show up on earth to Noah who had seen nobody weirder than himself. You know, when Noah was alive, he was the weirdest human being that was considered to be normal. Because the other guys were so weird, they were like 24 feet tall or 78 feet tall. They were, they were the sons and they were the offspring of the giants. And so people knew that those ones were strange. But the people who were still supposed to be normal, who hadn't mixed themselves with the blood of fallen angels, Noah was the weirdest of them because when he was born, his father ran out of the room because they had never seen a person like that. Hist historically, he was an albino. He was the first albino they had ever seen. It was such a serious issue that Lamech, the father, had to go and intrude upon the meeting that, Meth uh, that Enoch was having in the company of the angels. And it was like, Grandpapa, Grandpapa, we have an issue. Who is this and what is this? We have received a son whose likeness must be as of them who dwell in the stars because he doesn't look like us. And so someone who himself hadn't really seen weirdness because he doesn't see himself would now receive the visitation of an angel that was coming straight out of the presence of God. I mean, when was the last time you read about an angel that is in the presence of God that looks like somebody you want to see at Kroger? You know, when we read those things, sometimes we're like, oh my God, I wish I could just see the presence of God. Be careful what you wish for because I've read those things again and sometimes I'm like, maybe... We don't want to see these guys. You know, people with four heads. And then, you know, the seraphim, they're usually very close to the presence of God. And the word seraphim means the burning ones. They are made of fire. They're constantly burning. And if you've seen that movie by Nicolas Cage where he was a bike rider. And he would, what's it called? Ghost rider. Yeah. Ghost, ghost. The word ghost is the word spirit. Particularly scary spirits. You see? So Caspar does not qualify to be a ghost. They should have just called him Caspar the Spirit. I'm okay with that. He's not a ghost. He doesn't scare me. But I tell you what, you saw the way he became flame. How scary that was. I don't know about you, but I was speaking in tongues at that particular point in time. You, now imagine someone showing up like that who is about maybe 150 feet tall, just burning continuously. He could come with a message from God, but that wouldn't be for me because I wouldn't hear it. I will be gone before he opens his mouth. Oh yes, Peter, James, and John, they saw Elijah and Moses. These were people, human beings, just transfigured, right? So they still looked like human beings. They were probably still about six feet tall or a little less, but they just had the glow of transfiguration. And Jesus was with them. And still, fishermen who had seen all kinds of terror upon the seas, the Bible says they fell to their faces as though they were dead. You understand what I mean? So again, be careful what you wish for. Y'all have heard the story of Joshua when his mom, just out of glorious exuberance, prayed that her son would see angels. And the poor boy did not know any better. He said amen and was gleeful. And when he saw the angel, he was shaking like a single broom. You know when you hold a broom, a single broom, the way he wobbles. That was the way the guy was wobbling. He was shaking. He was like, oh. I, I said, take it easy. Describe what you have seen. And he said, he can't be friendly. I said, why did you come to that conclusion? He said, he didn't look friendly. I said, well, the Bible didn't promise us that angels will look friendly. The Bible just says we need to be friendly. You understand what I mean? God help you. But then at the end of the day, <laughs> where was I going with that? This angel, the Lord said to him, stop. Conceal yourself and introduce yourself as having come from me. For a very long time, I didn't understand that. Until one day I was doing the deep study of the experiences of Adam and Eve. And one of the things that I found from the historical records that are mostly kept out of the Bible that was made popular was that Adam had several encounters where Satan would conceal himself sometimes as a woman, sometimes as a, as a priest. And that is the reason why the men of old understood that Satan operates by taking on the form of the angels of light. So when you read things in the New Testament that were written by the apostles, we also need to know that they read things. They didn't just write everything they wrote as only known by them and to them. A lot of what they wrote, they wrote from what they had also read. And it was very apparent. 
You know, my favorite example is this. When Paul was writing about the experiences of Moses, he said Moses was challenged by the magicians of Pharaoh and he mentioned their name, Yambre or, or Jambres, as some people call it, Yambre. And what's the other one? Janis. He says, let's call it like my wife calls it, Janis and Jambres. But when you read the Old Testament that is in your hand, you will not find those names. Where did he get it from? He must have gotten it from the book of Yasha because those guys read the book of Yasha up until the 1600s. In fact, it was in about 1806 that they made it disappear because he has too much information. You cannot control people who are smart. I'm not talking about people who are smart because they've gone to university. I'm not talking about prepackaged information. I'm talking about genuine truths. You understand what I mean? And so when people know the truth, Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But we know that the order of the world system today under Lucifer is such that men have been reduced mostly to non-thinking beasts that just go wherever they are told to. They only believe what the experts have said in the news. They say, oh, and the experts have said. You? What makes them experts? What? The same guy who thinks that the sun is a million times bigger than the earth and is a million times away, he's an expert. Well, if he's an expert, then I'm a... But you, you see where I'm going with that? There's a reason why some of these things have been hidden. But it's okay because the Bible did not say that everything will be brought to us. The Bible says be like the Berean Christians who after having sat under the tutelage of the apostles will go away to seek these things out. The Berean Christians, I've shared with you the experience of one day that the Lord took me in the spirit by the hand of his angel and I saw the Berean Christians, how they would make plans to go and beg for people to let them read books that are not supposed to leave certain buildings and they would sit outside to read. And when they, when they were seen to be constituting the nuisance, they would offer to sweep the street and make themselves useful just so that they can be allowed to stay there until the book is read by one person and passed on to the other. Paul commended them because of all of what they put into studying and seeking out scriptures. And when you look at the apostles, you're not supposed to just read what they wrote. Do yourself a favor and read also what they read. And so when you look at some of the things that they read, it became very apparent that they got to know things like Satan disguises himself as an angel of light because there are so many historical records in scripture that talks about how Satan disguises himself to deceive people. And so when God was saying to that angel, he says, conceal yourself, but say that you are from me because these people are already familiar with the gimmickry of Satan. They may not listen to you if you do not come with the authority of my name. You know, but... Someone is like, okay, wh why do I need to know that? Let me give you at least one reason why you need to know that. The generation that we're in right now is such that people no longer test spirits. They just believe everything that has a color. The Bible says, test all spirits that you may know that which is of God. People have become accustomed to just receiving anyone that comes in God's name. People will just say, oh, I have come to you. My name is Bishop Zomo Zomo, and I have a word from the Lord. And I'm like, okay, Mr. Bishop, I'm already suspecting you the fact that you had to introduce yourself as a bishop. <laughs> when Jesus was here, he was son of God, but he would introduce himself as son of man. I would rather you introduce yourself as the, the uh, what's it called, with your lower title than what you think is your higher title. You know, because the moment you come at me and you're introducing yourself with a big name is that you're trying to tell me that I need to see you as something. And by so doing, you are putting the message second and putting yourself first. Whereas the message is what makes you a messenger. I want to see the message. Jesus says many will come in my name, but if they don't have fruits, keep moving. He says by their fruits, we shall know them. You see what I mean? And so when Moses saw the burning bush, he saw a bush, a bush that was on fire and yet the foliage was not consumed. The leaves were not reducing in size and, and there was no smoke. Already, if that was me, 
I would have concluded, this must be God. But he was like, uh, excuse me, this is amazing, but who are you? You understand what I mean? And that is what the men of old were trained to do. I wish somebody taught me this when I was 15. I would have been able to identify some people that I wasted time with in the name of serving alongside of them in ministry. I would have recognized them from seven and a half miles away as not of God simply because I was not taught to ask questions and test spirit once they show up and they say that they're Bishop Zomo Zomo or they have come in God's name. I'm supposed to just start dancing. Oh, the Lord has sent me a man of God. No, I'm supposed to ask, who are you? You understand what I mean? And so the angel of the Lord came and God, I mean, before he left, God said, you have to introduce yourself properly. You need to say that you are from me. But where I'm really going with that is the fact that when he came to Noah, he brought the word of the Lord. And what did the Lord say to tell Noah? He said, tell Noah that I'm going to do a work on the earth. I'm going to destroy the old and I'm going to bring about the new. And the Lord said, Tell Noah that he needs to speak a blessing of fruitfulness upon the earth that I may perform it. So God says, Noah has to speak it and then I will do it. And that is the origin of scriptures like the power of life and death are in the tongue. The Bible says, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, the Lord has ordained strength. And so here is the deal. Many of us are not seeing things because we are not saying things. You're complaining about the darkness, but God saw the darkness. He didn't complain about the darkness. He said what he wanted to see. Many of us continue to empower our difficulties in the place of prayer. You keep saying, Lord, I don't want to continue being poor. I don't want to continue being in pain. But the things coming out of your mouth is what? Poverty, pain, suffering. Why don't you say, I want to be free. I want to be whole. I want to be strong. The Bible says, let the weak say that I am strong. Let the poor say that I am rich. The weak is not supposed to keep saying, oh, I am tired of being weak. Guess what? What you are empowering is tiredness and weakness. You're supposed to say, oh, I am strong. I am strong. Because the Bible says you call the things that are not as though they are, as though they were, so that they might be. If you want to see change, speak change. If you want to see life, speak life and be specific. You see, because sometimes we are describing what we want, but the powers that make things happen are so advanced that if they should do everything you said in its vagueness, you will cease to exist. Because they would create multiple instances of existence to satisfy the condition of your random expression that every piece of you would have to be taken to, to be represented in the many universes that they create. Because certain things cannot exist together, but you keep describing them because you lack clarity. You understand what I mean? And so the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence because out of it are the forces that govern life. And we know that these forces are called eternal powers. In Romans, excuse me, in Romans chapter 1 verse 20, the Bible calls them eternal powers. That doesn't mean that they have always been. They have always been. That doesn't just mean that they will be forever. They will be forever. But the word eternal means boundless, limitless. These powers have no limit. And so you need to be specific. When God was creating the earth, he was very specific. He said, let there be a firmament. But many of us would have stopped there, would have just said, let there be a firmament. And then the firmament will be there and you will be looking for it. Because it will still be in the water. He said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, separating the waters from the waters. The waters above, they will be called heaven, which means I have already called you heaven. I don't want to see you down here unless I say so. And that is the reason why the men of old said, by the word of his mouth, he set boundaries for the waters. The boundaries for the waters were set when God was describing what he wanted to see. How did God see? God spoke. 
Whatever you want to see is what you need to say. Stop describing what you don't want to see. God is not blind. He is not deaf. He is not dumb. He knows what you have need of before you start. Why are you describing it back to him? You are not the news for crying out loud. You are his son and daughter with authority to make things happen. Because quite often that's what we experience, right? We're exposed to a system that keeps describing chaos without describing solution. When you watch the news, they're talking about all the killings, all the, all the robbery, all the lies, all the failures, but they don't come and say, well, when we spoke about this carjacking situation, we have a solution and we have called the elders in that area. Nobody prefers solution because light is not given to them. You are the light. They are of the darkness. And so they keep describing the darkness and they do a great job at it. And their master commands them because they are unjust, but they're doing what they're supposed to do. Okay, we're going to get back to that in a minute because that was where we started from, right? But look at you. Find yourself in Genesis chapter 1 verse 4. The Bible says, And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So the first entity here was the light that God saw. <laughs> that is entity number one. Entity number two was the Bible says, and God saw the light. And what else did God see? God saw that the light was good. So God saw good. And the Bible says God divided the light from the darkness. So there was another light, which is the third entity. And there was a fourth entity, which is darkness. I'm, I'm just going to say it very quickly because it's only preliminary to other things that I wanted to say. You see, God begins a thing from the end thereof. Of the four people, and the four categories of people, the last one is what? Darkness. But darkness was the first thing that God was presented with. Many of us keep forgetting that when God started with us, we were darkness. But we don't have to remain darkness. We can advance into that third category, which is light. But don't just be light. Be a good light. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Light is not good until it has works. If the sun only shines to burn your skin, are you going to be happy with the sun? The light of the sun is celebrated by all because of the good works that it does. Giving you vitamin D, empowering the land to produce fruit. It is the good works of the sun that allows for us to put up with the heat that it brings. And so if you are light without bearing good fruits and without going, doing good works, being light will always cause trouble between you and people. Because your, your existence is blinding and they don't see the reason why you are here. You get saved and you start walking with the Lord and the Lord transforms you from the kingdom of darkness. He translates you into light. But you are just light. You are not doing good works. And people are like, what is the value of this person that doesn't drink with us anymore? You don't party with us anymore. But your decision to live right is not doing anything for us because you are still as unforgiving as you were before your translation. You are still as confused as all of us were in the darkness. We come to you to ask you for what we must do. And you're like, even me, I've been online all day just Googling and searching. So what is the point of your life that is not good is usually considered an inconvenience. And so we exist in those four stages and we need to know what stage we are in because not every one of those stages gets a commendation from the master. The Bible says the master looked at the unjust servant and gave him a commendation simply because even though he started out being unjust, he tapped into light, which is heavenly revelation, to know how to comport himself in the service of the master in such a way that the master said, this is good stuff. Light came out of darkness. And when the Lord saw that that light was performing, 
He made it stand on his own in the presence of God. And God was able to see him. God wants to stand you in front of him. And that is what it means to be glorified. To be glorified just means to be presented to the Father because he is the Lord of glory. When you stand in his presence, you have glory because glory shines. Let me say that again. Jesus was glorified. Right? How was he glorified? Not by being resurrected. After he was raised from the dead, after having spoiled our principalities and powers, he showed up on the surface of the earth and one of the women who saw him wanted to touch him and she, he said to her, no, 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 do not abort my process. I may be reasoning quite all right. He says, but I have not been to my father. And the Bible says that when he went to his father, he was received into glory. And so when that light stood where God could see it, that is the end of every one of us. When we stand before our maker, pleasing unto him, and then he can say, can you all see? That's mine. That right there is mine. He started out being darkness, but he responded to my word and became light and continued in obedience and godly sacrifice to do the good works and to bear the good fruits. And that is why he is now able to stand to receive my commendation. God's commendation is glory. God puts his glory on you and that is commendation. How do I know that? Look at the life of Jesus. The Bible says that when he stood before the father, resurrected, having completed all of what he was supposed to do, the father said, now you can sit. And, and I will make your enemies your footstool. You are now glorified. You don't need to get your hands dirty anymore. We'll take it from here. And so I want to encourage you. Learn to find yourself per time in one of these four states. Am I still exhibiting darkness? Am I finding it difficult to allow the word of God to rest well with me? You know, darkness does not like light. And so whenever you read something in the word of God and it's like you're struggling with it, you know, you know, sometimes you read certain things in the word of God and you're like, oh, maybe there's another translation that cannot possibly be what it means. Oh yeah. You know, because sometimes you read when the Bible says, when you bring your sacrifice to the altar and then you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your sacrifice and go and make peace. You're like, mm, well, actually this sacrifice is really important. And that other person, they're very, you know, I've tried talking to them, you know, in my thoughts and I know how it's going to go. So I'm not going to bother. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, so many times we convince ourselves that certain things are always just going to be the way we have thought about it. And God is not telling you to stop at the conclusions of your thoughts. He says, arise and go. You see what I mean? He wants you to go. That's a word for somebody else. You've been, you've been experiencing the paralysis of analysis, just analyzing everything in your mind and thinking that is the way it is. You will never really know the way it is until you have stepped out. Remember, step forward from, I think, last week. Praise the Lord. So we may not be able to dive too deep into um, verse 12 of Luke chapter 16, but I want to touch on uh, verse 8 very quickly. Because now that we have the foundation, we can continue at another time or you may even continue on your own. Because one of the things that I want to bring out from verse 12, actually, let me just quickly bring it out. I know that God would allow for the light to explode in your heart on your own as you meditate. Luke chapter 16, verse 12, the Bible says that if you have not been faithful in another man's, who will give you your own? And what I want to talk about today is which other man are we talking about here? You see, many of us, we struggle to recognize that we have become the righteousness of God in Christ. We are not faithful in the work that Jesus has done. And that is the reason why we don't have good works. I'm going to say that again. Do you know that many of us still expend a lot of our spiritual energy in trying to attain righteousness instead of applying righteousness? <laughs> your righteousness is not of your own works. The Bible says, Paul speaking, he says, by grace have we been saved through faith, not of works. 
not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. It is the free gift of God. Jesus was the one who did the works. And by his fulfillment of his assignment, or by the fulfillment of his assignment, he was made sin in the process so that you can be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He was not made a sinner. He was made sin itself. So that you can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And the reason why you are struggling to receive the, the peace and the joy of, of the kingdom and of your salvation is because that prerequisite that is called righteousness, you still do not have an understanding of how to handle it and how it applies to you. I have to be faithful in Jesus' work. Because if I'm not faithful in another man's, who will give me my own? Jesus already did the works of translating me from darkness into light. But instead of me applying the righteousness gift that I have, I am expending resources to attain righteousness. Let me give you an example. Many of us, there are certain things that we know to do. For example, you know that you need to witness to other people. But you convince yourself that you're not there yet. You convince yourself that there are certain things that you still need to do to attain that confidence in yourself to do what your heavenly father is asking of you to do. Are you now saying that the works that Jesus did to give you righteousness is not enough? You need to add your own qualifications to it before you start shining as the light? Remember that the light that God was talking about here was made separate from the darkness. How? John chapter 1 verse 4 says the light in him was life, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, the word that became flesh. And that life was the light of men. The light shines forth in darkness and the darkness cannot comprehend it. When light is shining, guess what? It's producing good works. So instead of you applying that light, to bring light to others, which is what good works really is, you are still trying to attain illumination. Many of us, we struggle on the daily basis in our thoughts with the things of the darkness that remains in our flesh. Because even though God says, let there be light and there was light, the Bible says God looked at the light and he saw that it was good and separated it from the darkness. The darkness he called night, the light he called day, but that darkness is still there. He never got rid of it. And that is the reason why after you got saved and your spirit became illuminated, born again in Christ Jesus, your flesh is darkness, it still remains. God just separated your spirit from your flesh. So you can come before the throne of grace looking like Jesus. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because you're no longer carrying that flesh with you because you have been made separate from it. Because that flesh will forever remain darkness. The Bible says that to be carnally minded is death. And the carnal man remains enmity or in enmity against God. It will never be a friend of God. So the darkness is there, but you need to recognize that you have already been made light. But many of us, what we do is we keep looking at the darkness. We keep looking at the frailty of our flesh. We keep looking at the fact that I haven't done all of the things that I need to do. I am still this in the flesh. So I need to first of all fix me before I obey him. I want to be faithful in the work that Jesus did. Jesus did all of that so that I can come boldly before the throne of grace. He did all of that so that I can obey the great commission that says go into all the world and preach the gospel. If I keep looking at my weaknesses, if I keep looking at the darkness of my infirmity, if I keep looking at the frailty of my flesh, if I keep debating between my spirit and my flesh on whether we're good to go or not, I am trying to create my own work to present myself for another assessment when already I have been justified. I want to be faithful in what Jesus has done so that I can then produce my own good works. Jesus says, I have done mine. It's your turn. 
He says, greater works than I did shall you do. So don't just sit there thinking that there is no order to this process. There is an order. Acknowledge what Jesus has done. And what was the work that he did? He did all of that to make me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Which means I am always good to go. To do whatever my heavenly father says to do. Let me tell you something, folks. There was a time in my life that if I spoke to somebody before speaking to God in the morning, I would have a bad day. Not because a different devil came out of hell, but just because I, I, would, I would condemn myself. Because I made a resolution that God would be first in my life and that I would talk to God first before I speak to anybody. And so if somebody comes into the room and I'm like, hey, can you get me that stuff? I'm like, oh my God, this is not a commitment that I made. The Bible says it is better not to vow than to vow and not to keep the vow. I put all of that weight on me that Jesus did not put on me. And guess what? The devil knows how to come in at such times to sow seeds like, well, you've already broken the vow today, so don't expect much from today. Just pray the day goes quickly so you can start again tomorrow. And that will start having unholy expectations. When I go to see people, like see a, lecture, a professor in their office, I'm going to believe that they're not going to be there because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. For a brief period, I became so legalistic and I did not even know it. Until one day I was talking to one of my cousins and he just looked at me. He says, wow. He says, I see a lot of Old Testament legalism in you. And I thought to myself, this one is an unbeliever, he's in the flesh. He doesn't, he doesn't know that I am abstaining from all evil. You understand what I mean? So I left. And then after a while, I was struggling with some weakness in my flesh. And so I was like, I'm going to go to this man and, and say, look, I'm struggling in this area. I was like, well, welcome to the club. Me too. And I'm like, but you are still ministering. You're doing this. He said, yes, because in my weakness, he is made perfect. I cannot tell myself that I am unworthy because of the fact that I pass by people on the daily that I know I should witness to, but sometimes I talk myself out of it because the situation looks awkward. He said, because I know what to do and I don't do it, that makes me a sinner, right? He said, that's where your problem. My problem was I was struggling because the Bible says he who knows what to do that is good that does not do it, to him it is sin. And he was like, but you can't beat yourself up all the time. You can't get hung up all the time. Keep going. You have been made whole. Amen. And you know what? When I left that place, I was finally able to hear what the Holy Spirit had been saying to me. And you know what the Holy Spirit said to me? He said to me, he said, I have been reading the Old Testament alone without going into the New Testament. I went through a season wherein I just couldn't get enough of the Old Testament. And that is what the Old Testament will do to you. There are so many laws, so many do's and don'ts that when you read it to a point, you forget that there is the new covenant with better promises that speaks better things than the blood of righteous Abel. The blood of Abel is speaking vengeance. That, that's what the blood of Abel speaks. You wrong me. You pay for it. And the blood of Jesus says, if you know what it means, Jesus was actually quoting from Hosea chapter 6 verse 6 when he said to the Pharisees, if you know what it means, that the Father desires to show mercy than judgment. You will not condemn the guiltless. This is a tone of message or this is a line of message that people have taken and run with in the world to preach licentiousness for people to take their liberty as an occasion for the flesh. And that is the reason why some of us don't want to hear it anymore. We, want, we don't want to hear that Jesus perfected our righteousness. We still think that we have to earn it. No, what I am saying to you today is that that should be your starting point. You have already been made righteous. There's no time of the day that you cannot speak to your heavenly father. There is nothing that you do that disqualifies you from having access to the throne of grace. Because the Bible says it is that throne of grace that holds the mercy that you need, and the grace that you need. Come boldly before the throne of grace where you obtain mercy and grace to help in, in, in times of need. Do you know the reason why some of us don't pray as we should? Because we want to get to a place where we are at peace within ourselves. You want to think about all of the things that you should have done. So you come to God and the first thing you're doing is you're apologizing for this, apologizing for that, and beating yourself up. And by the time you're done, you're too tired and you fall asleep in your sin. Because as far as he's concerned, he's removed your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. But you, because it was your sin, you know the address of it. You know where to bring it back from. This man was an unjust servant. 
but he received commendation from the master because of the fact that he had understanding. Jesus says the children of this world, they have understanding or in their own ways. You need to have the understanding of the ways of God. Let me tell you something. One of the ways by which the Lord has helped me to apply what I am saying to you is back in the day, whenever I offend my wife or we have an, we have an argument, I would want to wait until I feel better, until things settle. So I go for a drive or pretend to be watching TV. But in fact, it's the TV that is watching me, you know. And one day the Holy Spirit said to me, what are you doing? I said, I need to feel better before I go to do what you said. Yeah, I mean, I would tell the Holy Spirit, you told me to go and apologize. It, I'm just doing what you said. You understand what I mean? Because sometimes we have not gotten there. But if we know that if we obey, we will get there. We get there anyway. There, is, there were so many times in the past that I would apologize to my wife simply because the Holy Spirit said so. Not because I was convinced that I was right. I mean, that, I mean, that she was right. Not because I'm convinced that it was okay. But I'm only doing it because he said so. And you know what I found? Whenever I did it, then all of that argument and all of that self-righteousness and justification in my head does not mean anything anymore because we have already achieved peace. So who cares about the, the details? You understand what I mean? Nobody cares about the details. I've achieved peace. And in the place of peace, I can then appreciate the lesson that I have learned. Many of us cannot even see the lesson we're supposed to learn because we're still occupied with the details. I said this, she said that. Maybe she should not have said that. That hurt my feelings. No, you cannot have, you know, concern for your feelings when you are in a marriage, especially if you're a man. Because the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church that he gave himself for her. You need to have died to self. And so what kind of feeling are we talking about here? Because I've gone to God to complain before about how my wife made me feel. And God was like, I don't even know what you're saying. And I'm like, my feelings. And it's like, which ones? Because I thought those things were already put to death. Are you not crucified with Christ? Aren't you supposed to be carrying your cross? Even if you notice a little bit of flesh emerging, you are carrying your cross. You have the cross 247. You should continue to kill it daily. You understand what I mean? And so I, I would say, I said to the Holy Spirit, he said, what are you doing? I said, I want to feel better. He said, I did not speak to your feelings. I spoke to you. So if your feelings don't want to go along with you, just leave them behind and go and do what I have said. You understand what I mean? And that was when I realized that, okay, I don't have to take the darkness with me. Because the darkness is just going to muddy the water. I just need to take the light. And what is the light? The life of Christ. The word of God. The heart of obedience. That is what I need to take with me. And I just go and do it. So basically, I get up because I'm like, okay, I may not feel right. But because Jesus did the work of obedience that made me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That qualifies me for, for this great privilege of hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, I will act in that capacity and then that gives me good works. Because why am I light if every engagement that I have with somebody else brings darkness to their soul? No, it's supposed to be that whatever darkness is in them should flee because I have come. We need to look at people as though we have been sent to them. If you're married, look at your spouse as though God has given you the privilege of partnering with him in bringing heaven to them. When they don't look, my wife, whenever my wife doesn't look like somebody who is walking on the streets of gold, I would always ask her, everything okay? I can ask her four times in five minutes. Like everything okay? You're not smiling. When we, when, when, when we first got married, my wife would always be like, did you do something? Because she'd been asking me if I'm okay. I'm like, no, I just see that you're not smiling. Because my wife was not naturally the smiling type. You may not notice now because she's been transformed in the name of Jesus. But she used to be quite militant, straight face, you know. She might not smile for like a whole day. You understand what I mean? But then for me, that is concerning because if I am already seated in Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father, when Jesus gets up to take a walk, he's walking on the streets of gold. My face should not be like somebody who is walking in a muddy puddle. If you're walking the streets of God, are you going to be like frowning? If you're walking alongside with Jesus, are you going to have a bad day? 
Now, so if you know that you are already translated into the kingdom of his dear son, it needs to show. So when I look at my wife and she's not looking radiant or looking happy or looking like someone who is in heaven, I would ask her, everything okay? Is there anything I can do for you? You see what I'm saying? And that is, be, that is the position that we need to take in the lives of other people. When you pray for people, pray for them as though you're the only one praying for them. When you meet somebody, make sure that they don't leave you the way they encountered you. You know very well that that person at work, when you saw them, they were looking morosed. Do people use that word? They were looking sad. Don't just say, well, I don't want trouble. They can take their sadness and go. You are now saying that light and darkness should coexist. No, I am the light of the world and I am the salt of the earth. I will be confident. Let me say this and I'm going to close. Quite often the reason why we see people who have been oppressed by sin and guilt is because what they're doing is what we may still be struggling with. And you're like, who am I to correct somebody else? Who am I to encourage anybody? No, that's because you're embracing your darkness instead of embracing your light. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're not standing there feeling better than them. You're standing there as somebody who has been helped, who is showing somebody else where help is. As we break bread today, I'm going to slot in verse 13. Actually, let's just read verse 12 again so that we don't get into another, we don't get into a second service. The Bible says, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you your own? I want you to make a commitment today. I'm encouraging you. If you still want to think about it, all well and good. If you want to wait until the video is released on Thursday to see if you agree, good luck to you. But I want to encourage you as much as possible, consider making a renewed commitment to be faithful in Jesus' work. And what does it mean to be faithful in the work that Jesus did? To not allow yourself to live outside of what he has done. He calls you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Don't allow guilt to get the better of you. Don't allow the standards of man to determine whether you feel good about yourself or not. He has already called you the righteousness of God. As far as God is concerned, when he looks at you, you are qualified to do whatever he has said for you to do. When he says love others as I have loved you, you don't have to be a particular person before you start loving. You are already equipped with all of what it takes to love people unconditionally and to allow the love of God that is emanating from you to cover a multitude of sins. Let us put aside all of those elements of, oh, am I good or um, am I bad? No, God says you are his righteousness. Get to work. Start bearing fruits. Start doing the good works. But it begins with making that commitment to say, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to be faithful in what you have given to me. This righteousness that you have given to me qualifies me for every assignment that heaven expects me to fulfill. And that is enough for me. And as I continue to fulfill my assignment by obeying what the Lord is doing, I continue to grow in grace and I grow in that righteousness. Many of the things that I have struggled with in the past have fallen away on their own because I did not make them the focus. The heart of faithfulness. Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. As we break bread today, Father, we call to remembrance that heart of obedience that Jesus exemplified. We call to remembrance the works that he already did to bring us before you as your righteousness in Christ Jesus. So that as he did those good works and we become more faithful in those good works, we will be able to have good works of our own. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. The Lord said to me, somebody here needs to be free from guilt. They need to hear Romans chapter 7. So I'm going to read to you a couple of verses from Romans 7. And I know that the way this set me free, it will set you free. Romans is after the book of Acts. That's for my own benefit. Now, let's read Romans chapter 7, 
verse 15. It says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not, will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Let me read that again. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Why? Because it is darkness. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then, verse 21, a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who would deliver me from this body of death? But I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He was so obsessed with the darkness of his infirmity, with the obscurity of his weakness, Everything was muddled and confusing. And he was like, I don't even understand what I'm doing anymore. This is Apostle Paul. He was like, I don't get it. Why am I in this dilemma? And suddenly, he just hit him. He just said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? When he was saying that, he was reflecting the state of you and I when we are not faithful in what Jesus has already done. He was wondering who would deliver him when Jesus already delivered him. The Bible says Jesus was raised for our justification. The moment Jesus was raised from the dead, we were already justified. And when he was glorified, we were glorified because we were inside of him. And so when he was still struggling, it was because he was not embracing what Jesus has done. So what did he find? He found by the Holy Spirit and immediately he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, through the works that he has done, I no longer have to identify with the one that is still struggling. I need to identify with the one that has been justified and made the righteousness so that I can be useful to God. He says through Jesus Christ, what else follows? He says, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Let me tell you something, folks. We can't keep putting off who we are in Christ Jesus. You can't keep putting it off. Yes, keep studying the word of God. Keep praying. Increase your prayer time. Add fasts to the mix. But don't wait until you feel a certain way because many of us feel like, oh, if we keep doing that after a while, we're just going to start feeling like a spirit. No, no, no. The best of men at their very best are still men. As long as we're, if this body can be made perfect, Jesus would not have prepared mansions for us. He's prepared new bodies for us that we will inhabit while we put away this corruption. So what am I saying to you folks? What I am saying to you is develop the ability within you by the Holy Spirit to prioritize what God is saying without hesitation and let your obedience deal with the disobedience. I'm going to prophesy over somebody here today and then we're going to break bread. This one, as I was turning around, what I see is that you keep having expectations for judgment. You keep thinking, oh, for what you have done or what you have failed to do, you have to suffer the consequences first before you can even expect any goodness from the Lord. And the Lord is saying, part of your good works is to receive the goodness of your heavenly father. You cannot earn it. It was given to you as a gift. Stop condemning yourself and embrace what Jesus already did.
And the way you're going to fix it is you have to tell yourself. You will call your name, stand in front of the mirror, and tell yourself that that is what I do because my flesh struggles with the law of sin. But I'm no longer going to let it stop me from obeying the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You need to demote your flesh from the driver's seat so that you can walk according to the spirit. Let me tell you something. God is doing a new thing and it entails you being able to make yourself fully available for him to use. God does not want to keep struggling between your, you. God does not want to keep struggling with your weakness to get your attention. He wants your focus to be on your assignment by the instructions that he has given. Do you know that some of us cannot even believe God for prosperity simply because we, we don't think we have done well enough? Some of us are still beating ourselves up because God gave us money and we wasted it. And now you're like, well, until I learn how to use QuickBooks, until I can handle this little money better, God is not going to give me another one. But God says for you to receive your own, just be faithful in the one Jesus has done. You understand what I mean? And so instead of limiting myself to what I am able to do, I want to, con I want, I want to concentrate on what he has already done. And that is the process. That is the order, rather, of the process that brings life. I hope we're getting it. I'm going to say one more thing, and then we're going to break bread. You see, Peter was one of those people who always wanted to use his ability to please Jesus. And when his ability failed, he went into hiding. He hid himself from the resurrection savior. I mean, could you imagine? I mean, can you imagine how come the women got there before Peter? Nobody ever got anywhere before Peter. Peter was always the first to get everywhere. He had that enthusiasm. When Jesus was seen walking on the water, he was the first to jump in the water. But when Jesus was raised from the dead, because he was still focused on himself and what he did wrong, he didn't kill anybody. You understand what I mean? He didn't take another man's wife and then kill the man like David did. No, all he did was he was afraid for his own life and he denied Jesus. He didn't deny Jesus because he stopped believing in Jesus. It was just that his natural self took the best of him by God's design. The Bible says if your strength fails in the day of adversity, that means your strength is weak. That's what the Bible says. The Bible did not say that means you're a bad person. Let me say that again. If your strength fails in the day of adversity, that means it is indeed small. God is revealing to you that you have little strength. And when you see that you have little strength, what do you do? You depend more on him who is your strength. But many of us, when adversity comes and he shows our weakness, then we build a tabernacle around the weakness and start beating ourselves up and throwing pity parties like Peter was doing. And so when Jesus was raised from, the, raised from the dead and he encountered Peter, he called him to the side and he was like, Peter, what's the problem? He says, Peter, I'm not asking for two, anything. I just want you to love me. Because I love you. So if you love me in return, the chain is, the circle is closed and the grace will flow. He didn't tell Peter to apologize for denying him. Jesus never said to Peter, how dare you? After all I did for you? No. The Bible says God gives without reproach. There was no reproach. He said to Peter, this thing is a love relationship. As long as you love me in return, you will be able to fulfill everything that I've asked you to fulfill. And that was how Peter got called into the ministry, by acknowledging the love of God. Acknowledging the work that Jesus has already done. I pray that you catch this revelation so that it transforms your life. So you stop being light that just barely came out of darkness. To become light that is shining doing good works, getting ready to stand and be seen by your heavenly father. The Lord is taking you from number four to number one. Keep shining. Let us eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. I want you to just raise your hand wherever you might be. 
and just um, make this declaration and just give thanks to the Lord. Say, thank you, Jesus, for the works that you did. I appreciate what you've done. I believe in what you've done. And I am, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. From here onward, I will do good by your grace. I will shine as the light that you made me. And darkness will not stop me. From here onward, I will do what you say. Because I'm already qualified to do what you say. In the mighty name of Jesus. And very quickly, we're going to just, um, we're going to close out here in the next couple of minutes. Alan can put the giving slide on so that that doesn't take any, any further time. Uh, but our deliverance that began today is going to continue. The work of deliverance that started here today is going to continue in a lot of our homes. But somebody needs additional equipping. And so, um, Matthew chapter 12, verse 1. The Bible says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grains to eat. Um, if I were to pick out the person that, or the people that this word is for, I probably would do a good job, but I won't do that. I'm just going to say to every single one of us. The significance of what I have read relative to what I've been saying and the assignment that we need to do to refine the commitment that we have made to all that Jesus has done rests on one thing and one thing alone. It rests on your ability to walk away from the law and to walk into grace. We are all hungry for God's commendation. Remember that we were made for his glory, every single one of us. Whether you see people that are drug addicts on the street, whether you see bankers that are committing fraud, whether you see people in church pretending to be holy, whether you look at yourself who is doing the best you can to walk in the things of the kingdom, every single one of us has a hunger and that hunger is to receive that holy commendation that this is my beloved child and my well pleased or to receive the commendation coming to the rest of your master. Every one of us, because that's what we were made for. But many of us, we are not able to satisfy the hunger because we are too afraid to break a law. The disciples were hungry on the Sabbath. And the law says you must not work on the Sabbath. But if they remain by the law, they will miss the fact that they were standing right next to the bread of life. Jesus is the grace of God. In person. And so if you are with the Lord Jesus. You take your hand. And you take what is on the field. To satisfy and to strengthen you. To do his assignment. And what is on the field. Is justification. Take that justification. Even though it seems like you're breaking the law. Do you know that when you begin to walk in this thing, and for some of us who have already started practicing it, you know that at the beginning it feels like, oh, something is still missing. I can't just stand here and be expecting for God to do something great. When I know that, uh, you know, I haven't fulfilled all the law. You, you will still be standing there thinking, oh, maybe I'm kidding myself. No, you're just living a different reality. You understand what I mean? You have come into a new belief system. They were hungry on the Sabbath, they would have stayed hungry if they were observing the law more than they were observing grace. And what they did was like, this is the God that I want to please and he's right here with me. I've already pleased him. Can we eat? You understand what I mean? You have already pleased your father. You can believe for great things. You have already pleased your father. You can believe that God will speak to you even though you have not read Genesis to Revelation. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't read it. If you believe right, you will do right. Is that good stuff? Yes. Tell yourself that you are free. free. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. You see, as I was about to step aside and ask Alan to come and bless the offering, I felt like I left somebody behind. 
you know, I felt like I left somebody behind. I could still see that person sitting there. So I had to go back and let them know that Sabbath was not, man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the law. The law was made for man. So you need to recognize that everything was laid out just because God wants you to have enough confidence to be in a loving relationship with him where you're not constantly beating yourself up. Father, I thank you because I needed to see that person get up. Yeah, get up. Get up. He that the Son has set free is free indeed. Leave the chains behind. They don't belong to you. Get up. If I let us all stand up, because I want everybody to tap into this thing. I know majority of us are there already. We're already processing and kind of like excited about how to apply these things in all holiness unto the Lord. But that one person is not going to be left behind today. It's a stronghold. Guilt has gotten the better of you. It's kept you back from believing God. You see, we receive everything that we have by grace. We believe to receive we do not perform to receive. It is after we have received that then we begin to perform in righteousness. We don't perform to earn righteousness. We believe to receive righteousness and then we start to perform in righteousness. Because every sacrifice that you make as an unrighteous person is abomination to your heavenly father. So you get it now? Believe unto righteousness first of all. And then you will start to do the good works. Now that makes sense. I thank God for your life. I thank God for the work that is doing in you today. You will sleep better. You will feel better. You will think better. You will raise your hand and pray more. You will sing more now because the shackles of guilt have been broken off from over your life. I thank God for you. I'm not going to call you out. I have no leading to do that, but I pray for you where you're at. And I know that the Lord is reaching out to you. Take his hand. Walk up those steps. And breathe a fresh air of privilege, of grace, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. Uh, Josephine, this week, God's going to allow for you to have an opportunity to tell somebody to just let God love them. Your eyes will be open. They sat in your chair and you would see the burden on their shoulders. Just tell them, let God love you. They will turn around so you will know that this is what the Lord has revealed to you. They will attempt to turn and look at your face. And then you will know that that is the person. They will attempt. Just You will feel the shoulder and just let them know that, look, no one of us can perform enough to receive the best life that God has for us. So why don't you just know that he loves you and that's it. You see? It's happening very soon and I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus that apart from seeing the salvation of the other and seeing their deliverance, even you will receive the boldness to do more of the work of an evangelist in the place where the Lord has positioned you. And I say to you that this is the right time. This is the right time for you to allow your countenance to illuminate the darkness of the others. You see what I mean? You see your countenance can illuminate their darkness. Many of them are just married to this technology and their profession, and that's what they want to talk about all day. It, it doesn't have to be by words. Just make that resolution within your heart that you will beam and radiate the light of that countenance. The Lord said to me, tell Alan it is time. They will feel the radiance of what you carry, even in the environment that you're in. Anyone who comes close to you will feel that radiance. It is time. You see, it's going to make the work easier of being able to witness, of being able to lead them. You see, I pray for you, Laura, that in the mighty name of Jesus, that the Lord will lift up your hand. He will lift up your hand. You know, the things that have seemed out of reach, that have even been forgotten, the Lord will lift up your hand. He will lift up your hand and you'll be able to just do more things. You see, because he's with you. He knows where your heart is. He knows the limitations that you have felt. And he says, the tools you need are not within your reach, but I will lift up your hand. In this season, the Lord is lifting your hand. If I were you, I'm going to tap into that word as well because I need to reach certain things that I've been looking at. Father, in Jesus' name, let the coals from the altar cleanse our lips so that the things that we say, they will be pure things so that the things that we see will be pure things. We're not going to speak based on our own circumstances and limitations, but we're going to speak based on your promises and your counsel for us. 
so that we begin to see your will happen in all of our lives. I want to pray for one person here right now. Right now, you have been worried about daily bread in recent times. Every single day is a struggle. It's like you don't even know how you're going to take care of what you need tomorrow. And you know they're going to call you. You know they're hounding you. And you don't even know how to respond. You see, you've been looking at yourself. You've been looking at people. Lift up your head and look at the provider. Ask God today in a prayer of supplication. Say, Lord, as I go to sleep, let me see your face. Because when you see him, you will become radiant. David said we beheld him and became radiant and we were not put to shame. The fear of being put to shame has crippled you. Because you know that they will ridicule you. They will, they, they've been trying to shame you because of lack. But you are not a needy person because your father owns a cattle upon a thousand hills. Give us this day our daily bread. I pray for you in the matter name of Jesus. It is your daily bread season. Wherein before you ask, he will answer. Before you seek, you will find because he is taking you over in this season. Father, in the matter name of Jesus, I thank you. So I want, I want you to know that I'm talking to you. You already know in your heart because it's been a struggle. And the Lord is saying whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You're free to live in abundance and in plenty. But you have to see the Lord. Where is that scripture again, Rosemary? We beheld him and, and we're radiant. Sir, Psalms, the book of Psalms. So I'm, I'm giving that scripture to you. So let everybody look at it because I don't want anybody to feel like I'm talking about them if they're the only one looking at their Bible. Psalms 34 verse 5. Psalms 34 verse 5. Quit looking at your problems. Qu quit looking at your inability to deliver. Keep looking at the mistakes. Keep looking. I mean, sorry. Stop looking at the mistakes. Stop looking at your own inability. Stop looking at the requirements that have been levied against you. Stop looking at all those letters that they've been sending you. Stop looking at those like your help is going to come from your oppressor. My help comes from above. And my oppressor is not above me because I'm not like grasshopper in their sight. I am a king and a priest unto my God. So for your sake, take note of this scripture. Verse 5 of Psalms 34. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. The Bible says in verse 6, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Which poor man? The poor man that looked to God to make things happen. Some of us is not materially. Some of us struggle with righteousness on the daily. Some days you feel good about yourself. Some days you don't. When you look to him in the area of your impoverishment, you will receive life. You will receive plenty. The Bible says that while the wicked needs to set a trap, before they eat. Proverbs chapter 12. The wicked needs to keep setting a trap. The Bible says the righteous only needs to speak and they will be filled. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for such a glorious time. We thank you because as we leave here today, we will not leave your presence. We may be leaving these four walls. We may be walking out of this building, but we will not walk out of your will. We will not walk out of the consciousness of the, what things we have been reminded of. And Lord, in Jesus' name, as we go on from here, we go on truly, onward, Christian soldiers, Unto light, unto radiance, unto peace, unto joy, in righteousness, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I just pray for us that as we give today, as we bring before the Lord our tithes and give offerings, all of that which we give in appreciation to God, in his worship, and in support of the work that has been done in his house, in this house, through this house, none of us will lose our reward. As you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. In the mighty name of Jesus, so shall men give unto your bosom. And I've been reminded by the Lord, and I'm going to say this very quickly, and let us go, that some of us need to make a commitment to support what is going on in this house. Some of us need to make a commitment. Just say to yourself, I want to make a commitment that I know will be significant in paying for what's been done in this place. Let me say this, God pays for his work. Before we gave, his work has been ongoing. And so what we're saying is we want to embrace the privilege of being his partners. All right? And as we make those decisions on our own, we will have peace and we will be guided by the Lord 
into, into partnership that makes us relevant in the kingdom. And so, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you, Father, because as you have said to me, I have said to them, now let your word, by your Holy Spirit, do a perfect work in everyone that you are inviting to come along to partake of what you have in this house and to partner with what you're doing in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty, God bless you. I'll see you on Saturday.